Hey everyone, this next story is about a lady who met her scammer in a Facebook buy, swap, and sell group. It's just a little reminder, there are scammers in every type of group, so we do have to be vigilant. And I apologize, I'm a bit under the weather, so if I don't sound my normal self, uh, sorry about that. Hopefully I'll be feeling better soon. On to the story. My story started in 2018 when I met Mark Jefferson on Facebook. We were both in this big Facebook swap and sell group for my area. Granted, I lived in a major city, so it's not unusual for this group at any given time to have 10,000 or more members. I had recently gone through a divorce, and, long story short, I was selling a lot of household goods, furniture, and things I no longer wanted or needed as I was moving into a smaller apartment from our three-bedroom home my ex-husband and I had lived in. I had sold a few items through this swap and sell group, in recent weeks. So, when Mark messaged me about an item I was selling, I didn't think anything of it. My ad read as follows. Recently divorced, selling sectional sofa and ottoman with matching recliners for $1,200. Flexible on price, must sell ASAP, paid $2,800 for set like new. I guess looking back my ad sounded a bit desperate, but at the time I was. I wanted this stuff gone. Mark sent me a basic message said he liked the couch, and was very sorry to hear about my divorce. I instantly checked out his profile, as I do with all people who message me about items they may want to buy from me, just to make sure they're okay. His profile was pretty blank. He said he lived in my city, was an engineer, and he had a few photos of himself with his daughter on his timeline. I messaged him back and asked him if he was interested in the items and thanked him about the divorce comment, but honestly I was glad it was all over. Mark said he was interested, but he was working out of town until next month. I told him, sorry, I can't hold items, and he said that he understood, and then he asked me how I'm adjusting to being divorced and how life is after my divorce. He said him and his wife are also divorced, that she cheated on him and ran off with her lover, leaving him a single dad with a little girl named Abby who was 10 years old. I told him, I have no children, but I was glad to be divorced, and my ex-husband was an alcoholic, and the whole marriage through only five years was stressful and terrible. I then told him to have a nice day, and he bid me the same. A couple days later, Mark sent me a message saying he was checking on me to see how I was doing. He said he was working in Malaysia until next month, and wanted to see if that furniture set was still available. I told him, I'm doing great, and sorry that the furniture set had been sold. I then mentioned to him that Malaysia is a long ways away from our city and asked him if his daughter gets to travel with him. I don't know what possessed me to even ask. I wasn't interested in talking to anyone and could care less, but for whatever reason I asked. He said his daughter stays with his sister and goes to a private school here in our city. I asked him which school, and after a few minutes he replied with a girls' school which, yes, had a private girls' Catholic school in the area. And as I said, the city is a major one, so it would be easy enough for him to look this up. Looking back, I think a normal person wouldn't have told me this information to protect his child, but at the time I thought nothing of it. He then said, it was very lonely being divorced, and he's been a single father for four years now. I told him I was struggling with being divorced, but looking forward to my new apartment, getting my house sold, and starting over. We started chatting a bit. He told me, about his job as an engineer, and how he travels all over the globe, and how he hopes to remarry one day when he finds the right woman. The casual conversation turned into a good hour of chit-chat. Your favorite likes, favorite foods, favorite colors, favorite music, things like that. He asked me if I had WhatsApp, so we could talk more in the future as friends. He said he enjoyed my company, and he's not always on Facebook, but he has WhatsApp on his work phone. I at the time didn't have WhatsApp, but I downloaded it just to talk to him. Days went on, and I found myself selling more and more stuff on the Swap and Sell Facebook page, and was nearly moved into my new place. Mark asked me how much stuff I sold, and if I've made good money off my sales. I told him yes, I've sold nearly everything, and I've made about $3,000 between the furniture, and a few $15 to $20 knick-knack items, and $50 to $75 household appliances. I said it adds up fast. I thought our conversation was normal. We talked about his job, my job. He asked if I manage okay with my job and the bills since the divorce, and I told him yes, all was fine. Our conversations turned from short 
hour-long ones to texting on WhatsApp through the night. He called me one night and we talked nearly four hours on the phone. When I asked him about his accent, he said his mother was from Russia and his father from Spain, that his parents divorced when he was six and he spent summers in Spain and schooled in Russia, so he had a mix of different accents. I didn't think about it. I just found it interesting, but I joked with him that he sounded a bit like a co-worker of mine who was originally from Liberia, Africa. Mark got very offended at this statement, and I had to reassure him that I was just joking, but looking back, I really thought he sounded a bit like my co-worker who was from West Africa. We continued our online friendship through WhatsApp. Then, he told me that he mentioned to his daughter, Abby, about me, that he had met a special woman. I was a bit floored as we have only chatted casually, nothing relationship-based, nothing sexual, but he said he felt in his heart I was a good woman and would be a good mother. My ex didn't want kids, at least for not another 10 more years, which honestly would put me at a slim chance of even being able to have any. So, the thought of me being this girl's mother, it kind of made me feel like it was a blessing in disguise, although things were moving quite quickly. A few weeks went on, and Mark and I started chatting for hours and hours a day. I was texting him at work, calling him when I got home late at night. He even asked me to email his daughter, and I did. She would reply to me, telling me how she can't wait for all of us to meet, and she would be glad when her dad is home from his business trip in Malaysia. A few days before Mark was sent to come home, he said he had made arrangements at a restaurant in our town. I even called to confirm the reservations, and sure enough, he had made them. This was all so exciting. He was set to come home, and we would meet for dinner. Part of me was thrilled to wake up to good morning text, and you're beautiful, and I love you text. My ex-husband half the time never wouldn't even notice me, let alone be affectionate and say those affectionate words. We agreed to meet in person at this restaurant, and then the following weekend, him and I and his daughter would meet in the park for a picnic provided him and I clicked in person over dinner. This was all going so fast, but honestly, I was loving it. Mark texted me. He was leaving from the airport, and he would call me when his flight landed. The flight from Malaysia to my city was about 19 hours with a few stops, so I hoped he would message me during layovers, which he had a few. The last text I got from him, he was waiting for his cab, and he would message me when he landed at the first layover airport, which was supposed to be in Dubai. I told him I can't wait to meet him and to have a safe trip. He texted that he loved me. I felt it was a little early for these kind of words, but I told him the same. I heard nothing from Mark for an entire day. I was worried sick. I messaged, called, and even sent an email to his daughter asking if Daddy had talked to her, but not wanting to alarm her, just general questions, and she never replied. I checked the flight number he gave me, and the flight had landed safely in Dubai, and his connecting flights had all landed safely at all their destinations. Maybe his phone broke. Maybe he couldn't get a connection. I don't know. I was worried, but I waited. I became sick not knowing. Then, I got a phone call from Mark. It was 3 a.m. and I was sound asleep. He said he had been robbed on his way to the airport and that the taxi driver had gotten boxed in at a stoplight and armed men shot killed the taxi driver and that he had been badly beaten and shot in the shoulder. He even sent me a photo of himself in the hospital, which I later found out was photoshopped. He was crying and upset, and I was crying. He said they took his credit cards, his phone, and all the medical staff there were demanding payment or they'll throw him in jail. He called me from a Malaysian number, which he had never called me from before. He said they allowed him to use the phone at the hospital to contact me, but he needed $3,000 to pay the doctor for the surgery or he'll go to jail. All his money, credit cards, bank cards had been stolen. He only had me to rely on and didn't want to scare his sister or daughter with this news. He was begging, crying for help, and told me if I could Western Union the money, he could make sure the doctor got it. He then put the doctor on the phone, a man who sounded similar in accent. Mark said he needed payment, or he would call the police, and since I was listed as his emergency contact, I need to send it. Mark then got back on the phone with me and promised he would pay me back. He wanted to get home to me and his daughter. I didn't think twice. I felt so much pressure from the doctor, Mark, and all I could think of was his daughter. So I took the money I had made from my swap and sell stuff, and I was going to use it to pay my rent in advance and my bills for the coming month, but instead I told him I would send it. He gave me the doctor's name. I sent it to the doctor's name via Western Union, and within moments he said he had picked up the money. 
Mark said he would come home shortly as soon as he was healed enough to catch the flight. I told him I would meet him at the airport, and he agreed. Two weeks went by, and we kept in communication, and with his daughter, who found out about her dad's robbery and thanked me for saving his life. The daughter started calling me her new mom, and emotionally it touched me. She then said that she was sad because her birthday was tomorrow, and her dad wouldn't be home, and her aunt could not afford any gifts. I was so emotionally vested in this by now that I told her I could bring her over a cake and present if it's okay with her dad. I talked to Mark, and he said he loved the idea, but his sister had no clue who I was and didn't want me to be in his daughter's life without him being there. Fair enough, I thought. I'm still a stranger. He then said his daughter loved iTunes cards, and that if I wanted, I could buy her an iTunes card, email her the numbers, and she could add it to her phone to play games. And I did just that. It was my way of giving her a nice birthday surprise. The next day, Mark was sent to leave and come home. He gave me the flight information, the numbers, and I was set to meet him at the airport. Before leaving, he made a comment that he hoped the flight served food and water, and I asked him why. Most do. They have snacks and meals if it's a long flight. He said he had no money or anything, and that he had to go to the embassy to get his documents to prove he was robbed in order to get the flight home, but that he had no real ID and no access to his bank cards. He had no money at all. He asked me if I could send a little money to his friend who worked at the hospital that he had met, but he had an ID so he could pick up the money. It was just $300, spending money for food, drinks on the way home. By this time, I was borrowing money against my savings, but I did it. I sent $300 to his so-called friend at the hospital. The money was picked up, and Mark said he boarded his flight. He texted me when he got to Dubai, then to London, then to New York, and on to our city. I arrived at the airport an hour before his flight was due to arrive. I waited at the airport and watched as person after person came through the ramp. I had Mark's picture on my phone, held it, and looked for him. I know he would be bruised from the robbery, and I searched and searched, but I did not find him. I waited a bit longer in case maybe he took his time getting off the plane. Still, nearly two hours, nothing. I asked an airline's rep if everyone was off of that flight, and she says yes, they were cleaning and fueling the plane for the next takeoff. I then explained my situation with tears streaming down my face. I think she felt bad for me, maybe thought I was crazy, but she asked his name and checked on her computer. No one by that name was on that flight. She also told me no one by that name is on the next flight arriving shortly. Which... I know she probably shouldn't have told me, but I think she truly felt bad for my situation. I went home angry and sad, texting Mark via WhatsApp with no reply. His Facebook page was gone from the Swap and Sell group when I looked for it, and it wasn't even listed on Facebook anymore. I emailed his daughter, and the reply I got made me sick. I asked Abby if her dad was okay. I waited at the airport and never heard back. The reply I got was the following. You stupid fool. Thanks for the money. You no good woman, go and die now. I was scammed. I was scammed by three different men. Whoever Mark was, the so-called doctor and the friend. I contacted Western Union and gave them the names, and I contacted the police, which they said nothing can be done. I gave them the information, and they referred me to FBI cybercrime website. When I called the Malaysian number, no one answers. The names of the men I sent money to were Ghanaian. I later found out there are a lot of scammers from Ghana who live and work and scam from Malaysia. The daughter I know was a fake, and I never spoke to her, and it was probably one of the scammers pretending to be a little girl. Since this encounter, I've received hundreds of friend requests in a month's time, from various military men, engineers, actors, strangers alike. All look fake, all are likely scammers using fake profiles. Lesson learned, but at a very high emotional and financial cost for me. Thank you for listening, and please be aware when you're in the buy, swap, and sell groups, because yes, scammers are there as well. And we'd like to thank her for sharing her story. If you'd like to share your story, you can find us on Facebook under Scamming Scammers Action. We can narrate your story for you and put it into a future video. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.